I'd like to welcome today's panelists, Professor Bola Akintenewa, Director General, Bolitak Center for International Diplomacy and Strategy Studies. Modele Sharafa Yusuf, veteran journalist and Arise News Analyst. And Yemi Adamolekun, Executive Director, Enough is Enough. Well, let's go straight to business. Nigerian President Mohamed Buhari highlighted the economic development of the country at the Nigeria International Partnership Forum in Paris. President Buhari identified opportunities for critical investment at the event, which was held in Paris ahead of the Peace Forum, which allowed participants and stakeholders to provide perspectives and guidance for mobilizing capital flows for the vital fund needed in the development of Nigeria. Arise International Correspondent Adefemi Akinsonya reports. The relationship between Nigeria and France has the ability to boost Nigeria's development. At the Nigeria International Partnership Forum in Paris, the Nigerian president, Mahmoud Buhari, called on investors to take advantage of the vast investment partnership on offer. Investing in humanity is investing in our collective survival. With this in mind, we have incorporated the public-private partnership model into our economic recovery plan to attract private sector participation in the financing and operations of critical economic and social infrastructure. This measure is already helping to mitigate COVID-19 triggered capital flight and decline in grant and development financing. The French government, too, excited about the mutual opportunities to be had with an economic relationship with Nigeria. Nigeria has uh, huge opportunities for uh, French companies. And in the same way, we have many opportunities for Nigerian investors and companies in France. And so this kind of uh, uh, forum, of summit, is very important. And I thank the Nigerian government to have organized this forum here in Paris, because I'm sure that it will, uh, be, it will be fruitful and it will create some strong partnership between our companies in the long term, win-win partnerships. And we have many, many different sectors in which we could do much better together. And so I'm very happy to have participated to this forum today. And sure, in the future, we will see more and more Nigerian and French partnerships. There were four plenary sessions, including discussions on security, infrastructure and Nigeria's investment climate. The second discussion focused on Nigeria's economic outlook, rethinking trade, development and financial inclusion in Nigeria. If you do think about investing in Africa, and we know, and today people are talking about what are the next frontiers for development and opportunities in the world, Africa holds the best frontiers for development in the world today. Your yield from investments can be the, is today the highest in Africa. And I would say this, and please pardon me if I say so. People are saying Nigerians should take the lead. And truly, yes, Nigerians should take the lead. But I'm saying to you, the foreign investor, if you think about Africa being the next frontier for opportunities and development in Africa, you do not have a choice. You will have to look at Nigeria. Present too at the discussion were French entrepreneurs already committed to investing in Nigeria. We do pay as you go for cooking gas. So each and every Nigerian can refill his cylinder with uh, 200 naira, 400 naira, and start moving from uh, charcoal or fuel wood into clean cooking. And we, we went to this event because we launched um, a subsidiary in Abuja. To, to, to be able to deploy this, uh, this uh, pay as you gas uh, technology. And that's, uh, we are a French startup, and Nigeria was obviously uh, uh, the market to be uh, and to come. I grew up and live in 25 countries in Africa, and Nigeria has always been very fascinating. First, like every country, you need to respect people, respect, understand the culture, and come with, pe with, uh, with trust. It was one of the wonderful uh, events for. Nigeria has actually to introduce himself to us as investment investors and French investors actually. But what I can say on 18 years experience that we have spending business into Africa, we now actually are looking at Nigeria as a fast growing economic countries. Now we're focusing with our boundary of investors on uh, 
250,000 social houses that we're going to Delta State to develop. Actually, it was great supporting it for me to see the minister here today. So because it was a little bit of blocking on the way, but I, I hope with the blessing of the minister and our President Buhari, we will go through by next month we come into Nigeria. We need actually to see how can we develop the social houses for our people. Nigeria's Ogun State is already home to many international businesses and its governor says its arms are open for more investment. We like to say that something new is happening in Ogun State and we believe that with what we are doing, where we are building an agro-cargo airport which will be ready uh, third, fourth quarter next year, which we'll call our Etropolis because it has the airport, it has a special agro-processing zone that has been supported by the African Finance Development Bank. It has the first African international status testing center that's being built by the Afro Exim Bank. It's going to have an Air Force base. So we call it an Etropolis. With something like that happening in Ogun State, where Ogun State known as having the highest number of reserves in terms of you have um, rubber plantations, palm oil plantations, cocoa plantations, you know, the number one producer of cassava, the number one producer of poultry, the number one producer of eggs. The entire agro value chain now becomes an ecosystem where you can produce in Ogun State, you can process in, in, in our airport, and you can export from Ogun State. So we like to say definitely something is, something is happening in Ogun State. If you are not in Ogun State, you are definitely not in Nigeria. Well, at the close of the Nigeria International Partnership Forum, conversations have been had, but in order for deals to be made, indeed, Nigeria must continue progressing towards having a conducive environment for that investment so that the country can continue to develop and reach its potential. Adifemi Akinsanya, Arise News, Paris. Well, another characteristically brilliant report there by Arise News correspondent Adifemi Akinsanya. She was on the ground in uh, Paris. And uh, when this came up on the morning show, uh, what I said was, oh, well, well, Governor Dakpabiono of Ogun State uh, wants uh, investors to focus on Ogun State. Well, Ogun State is the gateway to Nigeria. But joining us live now from Abuja, he's a Nigerian career diplomat, was a minister and head of political affairs at the High Commission of Nigeria, London, and the chairperson of the African Union Commission SRCC to Liberia. He was later appointed as the ambassador of Nigeria to France. Ambassador Akin Fayomi. Ambassador, ambassador Fayomi, uh, I expect him to join us to comment on this because as ambassador to uh, France, uh, he was in charge of uh, similar programs. This is not the first time that the Nigerian government would try to engage France and use uh, Paris as a connecting point uh, for other countries in Europe as a way of driving uh, investment. And it will appear uh, that the Nigerian government under President Mohamed Buhari lately has been trying to rebrand the country as an investment uh, destination. That is, post uh, the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, the president was in Riyadh uh, for a summit and he sold Nigeria to the rest of the uh, Middle East. And then, of course, he was at uh, Glasgow um, and I, or, uh, at a side event, uh, the Earth Fund side event, where Jeff Bezos uh, praised Nigeria and also uh, promised to support Nigeria's efforts with regard to the environment, with regard to uh, climate change. Uh, President Buhari also used the opportunity uh, to promote the efforts of the administration and to sell uh, this administration. And then, of course, he was in Paris at this particular Nigeria International Partnership uh, Forum, the same message. And from Paris, the president of Nigeria is off to uh, South Africa. I will not be uh, surprised uh, that uh, he will do the same thing, uh, selling Nigeria to the rest of the world, trying to rebrand Nigeria. But there are questions. There are issues, uh, not just with France, but also uh, on the domestic side of things. While we're waiting, uh, for Ambassador Akin Fayomi to join us. We'll take just a short break, and once uh, Ambassador Fayomi uh, joins us and we're able to establish, re establish the connection with him, the program, this is a live. The Sunday talk show will continue. We'll be right back. Stay with us. 
Welcome back to This Day Live, the Sunday talk show here on the Arise News channel. Well, we're still waiting uh, to establish connection uh, with uh, uh, the, uh, uh, Ambassador Fayomi, uh, who is in Abuja. Some technical problem out there in Abuja. But here in the studio, we have Professor Bola Kintenua, uh, who is uh, Director General Bolitak Center for International Diplomacy and Strategic Studies, and who is the author of a seminar book on Nigeria-France uh, relations. So while we're waiting for Ambassador Fahomey, I will uh, ask uh, Professor Akintenua to take the lead in uh, trying to look at the uh, significance, the possibilities involved in this uh, Nigeria International Partnership Forum that was held on Wednesday in Paris with the President of Nigeria in attendance, Central Bank Governor, and then, of course, the following day, we had the Minister of Finance reassuring uh, echoing some of the outcomes of that uh, forum. Professor Akintenewa, let me start with you. How important is this? It is important to the extent that it is a build-up to the foundation laid in 1990 with um, the investment uh, partnership agreement done in, in Paris. Uh, the foundation by that time was the recognition that Nigeria had acquired um, the status of uh, an important economic partner of France. Before 1990, information on um, French investments in Nigeria uh, was at best uh, scanty, insignificant. Different problems were raised by that time, especially the question of uh, double taxation. And this prompted um, the two governments to sit down to say, look, there were um, about 137 French companies as at 1990 in Nigeria. And in this case, there was need for special protection. So that foundation was laid. Since that time, both the governments of uh, France and Nigeria have always seized the opportunity in any part of the world, any platform, for self-projection to preach, to give the sermon of uh, the economic uh, opportunities that abound in Nigeria. And this is how to understand, for instance, the importance of um, the taking advantage of the Paris Peace um, Forum to, to organize this. The International uh, Partnership uh, Forum was organized by the government of Nigeria. And um, it took place on the sidelines of um, the Paris uh, Peace Forum, as I've said. And in this case, the importance to the extent that the perception of Nigeria internationally has not always been good, especially because of the um, much information given on insecurity in Nigeria. And since um, foreign investors are not much interested in investing in countries that uh, are judged to be insecure, the need for the government of Nigeria to go abroad and carry the campaigns to the doorsteps of the investors became um, a desideratum. And um, this explains the seriousness of purpose of um, the Muhammad Buhari administration in the, in the fight for uh, the use of foreign investments for nation building. Okay, Prof, before I bring uh, uh, Modele Sharaf Ayusuf within the conversation, you yourself wrote a book on this subject, Nigeria-France uh, relations. Mm -hmm. yes. And we have argued, uh, you know, um, previously on this uh, program, that the relationship with France is ambivalent. So, and it's been so since the testing of uh, the missile uh, around our region and then the civil war and the support of France for Biafra. Uh, what has been the trajectory of Nigeria-France relationship? Because, I mean, this is not the first time that we'll have this kind of investment talk. I was myself uh, working for President Jonathan uh, in Paris on many occasions at uh, this kind of uh, you know, forum. If we travel down the memory lane, 
you will observe that economic relationship between the two countries has always been uh, very good, very, very good, even during the Civil War. The issue is that uh, the relationship between the two countries is characterized by the principle adopted by K. Dose, dichotomy. The principle of dichotomy is separating political interest from economic interest. The relationship between Nigeria and France has always been fraught with suspicions, with problems, with um, much of hostility, disagreements. But these factors you will never find at the level of economic relationship. So the French government does not allow political misunderstanding, political disagreement to affect its economic interest in Nigeria. Look, it is always said that um, Nigeria and the um, neighboring countries, because they are Francophones, one major policy attitude of France towards Nigeria is aimed at preventing Nigeria from influencing the Francophone neighbors against French interests. And uh, reciprocally, the government of Nigeria also does not want France to have the capacity, the capability to use the Francophone neighbors against Nigeria's interests. Now, this is why we always have a uh, the question of rivalry. And um, this political hostility is to the extent that definitionally, the Francophone neighbors are neighbors of Nigeria by the rule of geographical contiguity, while France remains a neighbor of Nigeria by the principle of propinquity. In other words, geographical contiguity raises the issue of proximity. But propinquity is such that France and Nigeria share some um, common interests in global politics. So the, the two countries now try to take advantage of uh, the interests they share in common to sit down and um, negotiate. Now, no from that, Go ahead. now, from that, you will discover that, as you rightly pointed out, uh, because the French carried out atomic bomb tests in February and April 1960, and Nigeria warned or complained through the United Kingdom to, uh, to the French to stop, but the French did not. Therefore, the government of Nigeria now said when Nigeria will be independent on October 1, 1960, should the French carry out any atomic bomb test, they would declare a strained relationship with France. Most unfortunately, it was only France that had a diplomatic mission in Nigeria. Uh, the, the French only raised their commercial office. They, they raised the status to an embassy level. It was only as from 1965 that um, the government of Nigeria well, made the first well, to establish the relationship. Well, I, know, so, I know you are an expert on the subject, and I see <laughs> that you came fully armed with your book. Do you want to show our viewers your book on Nigeria-France uh, relationship? Because no. I, I, I can see the book on the table there. Yeah, you see, if you don't want to show it, I will do it. You see, okay. the issue is, this is uh, Professor Bola Akintenewa's book on the subject, Nigeria and France, 1960 to 1995, the dilemma of 35 years of relationship. Bola A. Akintenawa. Well, uh, the, Professor second, Akintenawa, the second volume, 1995. Okay. Tw uh, 2020. Yeah. And you know, you studied at the Sorbonne. It's in the works. So, yes, and you've been Director General of the Nigerian Institute of International Affairs. No, thank so, you. we have in house an expert on the subject. But uh, quickly, let me come to you, uh, Modele Sharafa Yusuf. Well, we're still waiting uh, for our guest, uh, Ambassador Fayomi. Look, 
of late, President Buhari has been everywhere. He was in uh, Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. He was in uh, Glasgow uh, for the uh, COP26. From there, he moved to uh, France uh, for the Peace Forum. And on the side, we had this international partnership forum. And now he's in South Africa. And everywhere, the president tries to uh, send Nigeria to the world. But one big concern, one of the issues discussed, for example, in Paris, against the background of the president, the uh, CBN governor governing the Mefiele, and the minister of finance later reassuring the world, is a question of security in Nigeria. When the president says, look, we have created an enabling environment in Nigeria for investment. Do you think that the rest of the world will really take us uh, serious, considering uh, reports about kidnapping, about you know Boko Haram, uh, farmers' head as uh, conflict, and all of that? I know a special session was devoted to that, and there were other stakeholders who were part of that conversation uh, in Paris. Uh, so, do you think there is any hope, or Nigeria is just uh, trying to rebrand without any strategic? Uh, mechanism in place to attract foreign direct investment. Before I speak to that issue of security, Ruben, I want to talk about uh, President Buhari's role as Chief Marketing Officer of Nigeria, the role which he has stepped into lately and um, which he's doing quite well. Um, it's what a leader has to do, market his country. Uh, and there's no bigger example of this than the French president, Emmanuel Macron, uh, in how he's been carrying on and engaging countries um, since he, he came into office. You would notice, for example, how um, he has brought the relationship between Nigeria and France into greater focus. There are uh, more uh, business deals being done between the two countries, courtesy of the relationship that the French president is, is, uh, is building. And I'm not surprised that uh, President Buhari is, um, is borrowing a leaf from this and also being uh, the chief uh, marketer of, of uh, Nigeria. But is, is uh, what he's doing, is it going to be enough in the face of insecurity? Um, you know, Nigeria is such a big country and there's so many opportunities and people are willing to overlook some of this problems that we seem to, that we have. We clearly have those problems. We have security, insecurity problems. We have corruption problems. We all know that. Everybody knows that. But if you looked at that, um, uh, the, the, the clip from uh, Akin Sanya, you, Adefemi Akin Sanya, Adefemi Akin Sanya, you, you would notice that people want to come. There's so many opportunities here uh, that this, international businessmen seem to notice. Stop passing papers. <laughs> no, <laughs> that would have got me into trouble if you were in school. No, I need the producer to, to No, no, no just, ki just, just kidding. So um, the truth is uh, insecurity would not dissuade people from coming. There's too much money to be made here. There's there are too many opportunities uh, for companies to tap into. And I, I really don't see insecurity as, as um, a stumbling block. Okay. Well, I've had that argument before. We have had the uh, heads of chambers of commerce on the morning show, uh, the other program on which I appear. And we were told that no, security is not the issue when it comes to investment. Mm -hmm. uh, but the other issue is President Buhari has promised that uh, his government will invest uh, trillions of Naira, about 1.5 trillion Naira for about uh, a period of 10 years. Now, where is that money uh, going to come from? But I understand that uh, Yemi Adamalekun is already with us. Yemi Adamalekun, oh, okay, Yemi is not yet with us. Uh, you I see, would have Ruben, loved to take her input, yes. I think Mondele is quite right. When we are considering France specifically in terms of um, the rule of um, insecurity. For France, France does not take a look at uh, the domestic environment as an issue. As far back as 1962, the French 
you know, we have the Elise and we have the K Dossier. The presidency may adopt a particular position quite different from that of uh, the foreign ministry. But the Elise has come to the conclusion that the future of Nigeria is great, that Nigeria is unavoidable in the strategic calculations of France, especially in her relationship with the Francophone African countries. Consequently, regardless of um, whatever problems of uh, insecurity we may have, it's not a major factor for um, the, the governments, for the COFAS, for the business investors. So I think you are right. But in terms of other um, foreign investors in other countries, they may want to take a look at um, security as, um, as an obstacle. But certainly not with the French. And that's why I was talking about dichotomy that, look, they completely separate economic interests from political interests. So you can be fighting. Look at it. Didn't the French uh, support um, uh, Biafran um, secession? Immediately after January 12, 1970, the French came to propose to Nigeria that, look, they can assist Nigeria with um, nuclear, um, nuclear power to generate uh, electricity and stabilize. But because of the role of um, the French in the war, we kicked against it. So insecurity, I think, does not constitute any major obstacle when it comes to foreign French direct um, investments in Nigeria. I, I share your, your, your position on that, but not at the level of other countries. Okay, uh, Prof, on that note, we'll take another short break here. Yeah. Welcome back to This Day Live, the Sunday talk show here on the Arise News Channel. Still with me in the studio, uh, Professor Bola Akintenwa, Director General, Bolitak Center for International Diplomacy and Strategic Studies. Uh, Yemi Adamalekun, who has now joined us, Executive Director in Office of, and Modele Sharafa Yusuf, Arise News Analyst and Veteran Journalist. We need to apologize that we are unable to uh, get in touch with uh, Ambassador Akinfayomi. The TVU crew that we sent to his house, uh, not only, uh, you know, they had uh, technical problems. I, I'm personally very angry, but let's, uh, you know, uh, go beyond that. Uh, well, Yemi Adamalekun, thank you uh, for joining us. Uh, Yemi, uh, we've been discussing the uh, event in France, the Nigerian International Partnership Forum, and uh, the efforts of the uh, president, Mohamed Buhari, uh, coming forward as the chief uh, marketing officer of Nigeria, from Riyadh to Glasgow, and now to South Africa selling Nigeria. And we have raised a number of questions. Uh, would these foreign investors that have been uh, attracted, would they you know, respond to the uh, promises made by the president, the uh, CBN governor of Nigeria, and also the minister of finance? And what is the concern? What should be our concern about that big issue about security? Thank you. Uh, I was having a bit of technical challenges myself. I think, as Ms. Modili has said, Mr. President is doing his job. He's the chief marketer of the country, supported by the ministers and the governors that do travel with him. But ultimately, it, they're purely commercial transactions. As much as we have insecurity, as she also said, that is publicly documented, is in the public domain, people continue to make profit from doing business in Nigeria. So at the end of the day, it's a really a cost benefit, or maybe not cost benefit, a risk benefit analysis that businesses have to do. What is the word of Muhammad Buhari worth to you? What is the word of the Godwin Emefili worth to you? What are our fiscal monetary policies? What do they look like? What do they mean for your business? And the truth of the matter is that, and I think we should, I'm not quite, I think it's Professor Akintai rather mentioned it, that we also can't shy away from the fact that in some ways it is the chaos that we have in Nigeria or the insecurity that we have in Nigeria that provides a business opportunity. If you have a country that's dealing with insecurity, someone who wants to sell arms to our army has a viable business. 
someone who wants to provide security gadgets, security apparatuses, um, CC, CCTV technology, I mean, things of that nature, there's a business for it because there is insecurity. There's a business for selling armed cars. There's a, a Nigerian gentleman whose business pivoted. I forget the name. The name escapes me at the moment. But whose business pivoted as insecurity increased because he started selling armored vehicles because there was a there's now a market for it. Okay. Well. So, yes, Mr. President, is doing his job. Yes, the challenges that Nigeria this and because businesses are coming in based on information that's available it's ultimately left to them if they believe that nigeria is a viable place for their business okay thank you yemi let's move on to our next subject the trial the leader of the proscribed indigenous peoples of biafra ipop Namde Kanu at the Federal High Court for alleged treasonable felony was told earlier this week because his lawyers were locked out of the courtroom. Security agencies on Wednesday frustrated the trial of the leader of the proscribed indigenous people of Biafra as they denied a member of the legal team access to the courtroom. Kanu's legal counsel, Ifai Age of Four, who had earlier secured a seat in the courtroom, went out to persuade the operatives of the Department of State Security Service to allow Kano's lawyer from the United States of America, Bruce Fain, to enter the courtroom. However, when Age of Four returned, the DSS operatives said he could not enter the courts. But the Director of Public Prosecution, who is prosecuting the case, told the judge that Kano's lawyers walked out on the courts. Khan was consequently left without the counsel. When the judge asked him if he was ready to conduct the proceedings himself in the absence of his lawyers, Khan replied in the negative. He however expressed his displeasure at the refusal of security agents to allow his American lawyer access to him. Since legal representative is a must in criminal trial, the judge consequently adjourned the case to January 19 and 20, 2022. The drama did not end there. Outside the court, as Khan was being driven away, his supporters started singing his praises. From nowhere, another group called One Nigeria Advocate emerged waving Nigerian flags. Members of this group came with drums and flutes. They danced towards Kano's supporters. Tension rose, but did not degenerate probably because security agencies were on alert. We are outside our wig and gown, we're inside the court. Our books, bags, we're inside the court. All of us were at the door of the court trying to resolve this issue. When the court came up, came on, came in, and they are now I call up the case. And without allowing us access to the court, we are locked up. And the matter was called up and adjourned to January 19th and 20th. So, the court is not oblivious of the fact that the matter has come up today for hearing of objection to the charge. The court is also not oblivious of the fact that we are in court today and we are in court to, to defend, to, 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 uh, to move our application challenging the competence of the charge. Namdi has been denied his right to counsel under the Nigerian Constitution, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, clearly requiring that he be released immediately. He's currently being punished. He's never had a hearing. He's been charged with actions that don't even make a crime. And he's six months at least in solitary confinement without access to medical care. This is a punishment before trial. Some of those who came to witness the trial say the only way to douse tension is to release Kanu unconditionally. With what is already happening inside the court today, we are the prosecution came in with nine lawyers, and the lawyers that is defending Mazin Nande Kano have not been allowed to enter the court. The question I'm asking about this in Nande Kano trial, and what does my question is what does Buhari want to achieve by this? What do I mean by that? The rules of fair trials is very simple. What are you hiding? If you feel a man have done something wrong. You try him publicly. Well, <laughs> yeah, that drama there at the court, Federal High Court Abuja, presided uh, over by uh, Justice uh, Bintan Yako.
uh, when uh, Namde Kano appeared in court. Well, uh, Yemi Adamolekun, let me start with you. Uh, the uh, counsel for uh, Namde Kano uh, walked out on the presiding judge. Uh, Bruce Fang, who is uh, the um, international lawyer for Namde Kano, was not even allowed uh, to access the court. Other lawyers were kept out. And then there was that drama outside, uh, turning the whole thing into political high drama uh, with supporters of Unamde Kanu singing his praises and a group called One Nigeria uh, defending the interests of the Nigerian government. What is your take with regard to this development? Thank you. Um, it will be, it's really quite unfortunate. I think Mr. Fine's statement that Kanu is being punished before the trial is significant because it, it, I think for me it was, a, it was a good way to summarize it. As the gentleman, the spokesperson for the United Political Parties, Coalition of Political Parties said, if you think someone has done something wrong, try the case openly and get a verdict, innocent or guilty. And the, the trend that we have, unfortunately, is just postponing cases as a way to punish because we know our prisons are are terrible places to be. So as long as we keep adjourning a case, keeping someone, as Mr. Fenn said, I'm not, I, I can't vouch for Namde Kanu's conditions in solitary confinement without access to medical care because you are adjourning a case. It is punishment because ultimately what we should be doing is trying to find the truth of a matter for whatever offense you claim he has committed. Showare is a victim of the same thing. December will be two years since he, he was released due to public and international pressure, but his case keeps getting adjourned, so he can't leave Abuja. Luckily, he's not in prison. He's under city arrest, if I want to use that word, because he can move around Abuja. But again, this is a man that's also been denied almost two years access to his family and his children. So it's not specific to Namde Kano. It's the way that we use the, the legal system and the judiciary to punish people that we feel are going against the state. I'm glad uh, with the debate that Arise and Enough is Enough co-hosted, the governor-elect of Anambra State did make the point very clearly that while he doesn't agree with their tactics, it does not. he believes that IPOP deserves a voice. And I hope that it, as incoming governor of Anambra State, his influence in actually just having a conversation around what, what IPOP uh, IPOP members want to have discussed around their role in Nigeria. And as you said, the counter protest, it'll be interesting to find out who sponsored it because I can certainly bet they did not wake up on their own and decide they want to do a protest to defend Nigeria. So very interesting dynamics of how we, how we protest or how we engage people to protest or give voice to things that they might not necessarily have anything, have anything of interest. But it is unfortunate and I believe that Again, two months, so he gets to be in jail for another two months while we wait for the next court hearings. Very unfortunate, but this is Nigeria. And tied to the business environment that we talked about earlier, this is what Nigeria portends for those who, those who engage. Well, Professor Akintenu, well, Bruce Fang, the uh, international lawyer engaged by Nande Kanu, uh, raised uh, some salient points about international law. And he threatened that it would take Nigeria to the uh, International Criminal Court on two grounds. The abuse of the rights of uh, Namde Kanu and also the way he too has been treated. And you know under the general principles of international law, there is a responsibility to protect the RT2P, right? To protect the rights of your you know, citizens and make sure that how you treat your citizens uh, is in line with international conventions in this regard. All the uh, conventions, from the Vienna Convention uh, to all the protocols elsewhere, from the United Nations Charter to the African Charter and all of that. And in the case of Bruce Fang, yeah, treatment of aliens, that's another major principle. He's an alien, so to speak. That's what the theory says. And, he, you know, you also treat aliens fairly, justly, as human beings. Uh, do you think that uh, in this particular case, Certain principles of international law have been violated, compelling uh, Bruce Fang to say, well, there are international law issues. There are many critical issues in the observation you've just made. The observation is not simple. 
is very complex. First of all, let's start with the IR2P, the International Responsibility to Protect. You are quite right. <laughs> the cardinal objective of uh, the principle uh, is defined within the framework of um, genocidal um, uh, crimes. That is, where there is a situation of genocide in a the country, then if the government in such a country is involved and is not doing anything, and where you are quite right is, where a government is incapable of protecting its citizens, then the international community has the right of intervention. So the, the international community does not need the permission of such a government to intervene. And I use the intervene in, uh, as distinct from um, interference. Now, the denier of um, entry to Kanu's lawyer, the American lawyer, uh, is more or less a reflection of conflict of law and conflict of interest. Conflict of law in the sense, or in two senses. Sense one is um, when you go back to the trial of uh, Obafemi Awulowo in um, 1962, when he was accused, was um, charged for treasonable uh, felony. Uh, the Chief Obafemi Awulowo recruited a foreign lawyer. And um, by that time, the law of the land was that uh, any accused person can hire, contract any lawyer of his choice. But the caveat is that such a lawyer, barrister, solicitor, must be registered as a barrister, as a solicitor in Nigeria. But by that time, the lawyer hired by Awulowo uh, was not registered. Therefore, he was not allowed to handle, to solicit for Awulowo. Awulowo uh, appealed against the decision. And what happened was that uh, he lost because the Supreme Court, at the end of the day, upheld the decision that, look, you have the right, all rights, to hire whoever you have confidence in. But for as long as that lawyer is not known by Nigerian law, he cannot do. So that is one side of the story. Now the American lawyer is quite right to want to go to the ICC, and beyond that, going to the American Congress to lodge complaints and to seek sanctionary measures against the government of Nigeria. That also is very consistent with international law. Because, as he rightly pointed out, the mere fact that he's just accused is presumed to be that he's still innocent. And now you, you did point out uh, the reports you have um, the prosecutor, the federal government, coming in with nine lawyers. And the accused, you are denying him of one um, American lawyer who he has confidence in to be objective, etc. all along. That in itself, the denial of the right of choice of solicitor, of barrister, who is most likely to come up with objective arguments that we suppress the allegations of the federal government. If you create obstacles to that, then where is the fairness we are talking about? And now, the, the other issue that is related to it, you see Nigeria, 
on the point of international law, practices the dualist uh, policy, not the monist policy. Many countries uh, adopt the monist policy attitude. Monism simply means that when you either paraph, you sign, you ratify, whatever you ratify at the international level automatically is translated to your municipal law. It doesn't need uh, to go through internal processes again. But the constitution of Nigeria is quite different. The government can ratify. There's no doubt about that. Section 12 thereof. Yes. It so says you see it should be domesticate precisely. International convenience should be transformed. So People say domesticate. That's a wrong phrase. It's transformation. That, that is what was put there. Our constitution says it requires domestication. But the right so, is transformation. That is from the perspective of another school of thought. Because <laughs> the constitution itself is a school of thought. That is our own language. That is the Nigerian language. We have the Nigerian language also. The Nigerian English language, as uh, founded by Zikism, <laughs> as they put it there. Anyway, so, so in this Let's case, in essence, what I'm trying to say is that uh, whatever international law may, may provide for, for as long as it has not been transformed for purposes That's of right municipal uh, enforcement, then... Okay, but the current position of the uh, law is that, look, once you append your signature to an international covenant, you are bound by it. But part of the problem we have in Nigeria is that we sign many of these international covenants without even reading them. International law is lawyer's law, but we send uh, civil servants to go and sign no, agreements Ruben, you see, on our behalf. You are raising the sanctity <laughs> of uh, anyway, no, a law. Anyway, it's okay. It's okay. Pacta Sun Sevanda has... Okay. Don't let's, have is, uh, an, don't let's uh, reduce this to the theory okay. of international right. law. And, and what do you mean yes. we sign these conventions without reading them? Well, I just told um, you that international law is lawyer's law. Because when you so, sign those agreements, you know, there must be lawyers. Because if they sign uh, on behalf of the country... Lawyers the people who sign on behalf of the country are not lawyers. No, once you sign on behalf of the country, mm -hmm. your country is bound by it. But that's not my uh, mm -hmm. point. What are your thoughts on this subject? Because we still have other issues. My singular thought on this is that uh, justice delayed is justice denied. Um, no matter what it is that uh, Kano has done, he needs to be tried expeditiously. So we can get to the, to the, to, to, to the end of this. Uh, justice delayed is, is justice denied. It is a legal maxim, meaning that if a legal remedy is available for a party that has suffered some injury but is not forthcoming promptly, it is effectively the same as having no remedy at all. Uh, this principle, as you know, is the basis for the right of a speedy trial and um, a similar rights which are meant to expedite the legal system. All of that covered under Section 36 of the 1999 Constitution. So this um, is clearly a political trial, but it does not negate that principle. It should not negate that principle. You well, see, Ruben, what the question we should be addressing, actually, is whether you allow a foreigner non-registered to handle the matter or not. The issue is no. He didn't but why say, should, but why no, should you Bruce, allow Bruce foreigner? Bruce Frank was not invited. He, he was not invited to handle no, no, the matter. No, no, no. He was invited as amicus courier because Namde Kanu made it very clear that he has a case in the United States mm -hmm. and he just wanted his international lawyer, you know, to observe proceedings. I don't. And there is a provision I, for lawyers to appear amicus courier. And in any case, it is at the discretion of the presiding judge Absolutely. to determine that's, that's the point who I was going to make. It is, is granted at the discretion of to the his court. Or My yes, problem sir. is not whether you are a friend of the court. The issue is that this prosecution, the ultimate objective, in whichever way you want to address it, I put it interrogatively this way, will it put a stop to the agitation for, you know, separate existence. Will, uh, for instance, um, winning the case against Kano stop the IPOB supporters 
from engaging in further pro Biafra state. Now I will say that Kano is just one of the agents of uh, Biafranism. So if you remove, if you kill, if you give a life sentence, in fact, that punishment itself will be a major dynamic for sustained well, struggle. Prof, there's been some reference in the papers this weekend about uh, the possibility of a political oh, solution. Out of court. Whether that will happen or not, we do not know. Because the Attorney General of the Federation, in an interview uh, with uh, Arise News, pointed out that, well, people will have to define their approach. I bet that so far, nobody has come forward with any kind of formula in that regard. Uh, but in any case, we have that case in court. Mm -hmm. uh, what the best you can ask for is that the accused person should be allowed to have his day in court and that the, uh, all his rights under Section 36 of the Constitution and under other protocols uh, should be respected. But I find it curious that these days, when you have some people opposing government, another group will just suddenly show up, either with uh, long sticks or with uh, drums or with uh, banners, are defending the Nigerian government. It is an indication of how divided our politics no, is. No, it's, it's, it's not a question of division. No, it's a question of division I'm because it means that there are different contending tendencies no, you see, within the Nigerian state. The context of the on. division has to be explained and understood. From um, historical evidence so far, when I use historical in contemporary times, the government has always been accused of uh, paying 2,500 2, naira all along to mobilize, the way Abasha did mobilize the people to protest. Yeah, but, but in but any so case, this will come, come forward as so citizens. It's not, yes, it's not new that in this case, when we are talking about division of no, the people... No, but they, are also, they are also Nigerians. For them to even collect the money and proceed with the action, uh, shows that that's the role they want to play in the Nigerian Not that they believe in it. Well, no, not you cannot determine yeah, that. So they need money and they no, are No, that's conjecture. You cannot determine <laughs> that. Anyway, let's, let's move on, Professor Akintenwa. <laughs> and we go to Anambra. Charles Soludo, the candidate of the All Progressives Grand Alliance, was declared the winner of the Anambra state election. He won in 19 out of the 21 local government areas. After a late start to the voting process in many polling units in Iyala, local government area of the state, the All Progressives Congress garnered 343 uh, votes, Abga 8,283 votes, and the People's Democratic Party 2,485 votes. This brought the total number of votes garnered by the three top parties to 43,285 for APC, 112,229 for Abga, and 53,807 votes for the People's Democratic Party. Let's take this report. For that Charles Chukuma Solodo, 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 <laughs> having satisfied the requirements of the law is hereby declared the winner and is returned elected. Oh. This is dated, dated today, 10th November 2021, and is signed by me, the returning officer. I think mine is simply to offer a few words of gratitude. Gratitude to the Almighty God, the Alpha and the Omega, who knew that this hour, at this minute, this day, that we will all be gathered here, and that this piece of paper will be in my hand and that of my deputy governor. You know, throughout the campaigns, we started our campaigns with a song. Fetuku de lo de goyao. Fetuku kulo kugoyao. 
and we often ended with another song. Who can battle with the Lord? Who can battle with the Lord? Who can battle with the Lord? I say nobody. So all honor and adoration belong to him and to the almighty God the Lord. <laughs> I like that. Look, uh, Professor Zulu is not just an intellectual. He will make a good career as a pastor too, <laughs> or as a leader, or, or, or at least as a, as a chorister of an orchestra. <laughs> but congratulations to him. Uh, very quickly, Yemi Adamalekun, again, I'll come back to you. You have been very actively involved from the civil society side uh, in the Anambra election, monitoring it, uh, co-organizing uh, debates, and also analyzing the uh, outcome. Over to you. Thank you. I want to start with where you left off, sorry, on the <laughs> Kanu case, because I didn't get a chance to come back. But I really want to agree with Ms. Modele that political trials shouldn't negate the right to speedy trial. But by the very definition of the fact that it's a political trial, it does. And that's invariably what happens. And we even see with the NSAS protesters, I believe we still have about 100 in prisons in Lagos, 11 in prisons in Oyo State. Another 100, I saw an article in prisons in Abuja. So for participating to, in your, your site, right to freedom of expression, you're lounging in jail for a whole year. And that's the nature of the political context that we work with in Nigeria. And also those who are paid to protest, Mr. Abati, I'll have to disagree with you that, yes, it's a choice for them to be there. But over and over again, we've seen people ask, simple question, what are you protesting for? And they can't answer you. So the fact that they are there and collected the money has no bearing on if they believe in what they're yeah. doing or understand what it is that they're doing. That's, I believe, the point Professor Akintariwa was trying, was trying to make. Now, to Anambra, I think it's really very, very interesting and significant. Two things that I would say, maybe three. Number one, the fact that people watched to see that IPOP's stay at home order had been lifted so that the pro people progressively came out during the day. So at the beginning of the day, even though INEC did have some late starts, but people were kind of watching to see what would happen before they eventually did come out, come out to vote. While the voter turnout, secondly, the voter turnout historically in a number about 20%. So 10% is low, but it's about 50% on, in a sense, on a good day. So to get 50% of what you would normally get in an environment with high tension, a stay-at-home order that was lifted last minute, I would say it's actually not bad that people did come out. And thirdly, that governor-elect Soludo's victory was, in a sense, con on convincing, if that's the English word, that you can't say he won by a slight margin, maybe, maybe not. He won very clearly. And I think even the final local government, ELR, speaks to that, because everybody knew that this, in a sense, was a deci deciding local government. If you took the number of people that were registered to vote in that local government, could easily have turned the election. But he won again, clearly, 140,000 plus registered voters, 8,000 came out for him. Again, clearly stating what, uh, what, their choice, what their choice in that election was. But I think he has, a, he, has a, he has a lot to do. There's the technocrat side of him, the intellectual, as you alluded to. But there's also someone who's familiar with government. So I hope the politician, quote and unquote, side comes through in what needs to be done, not only in Anambra with him as governor, but also in the committee of governors as we go into a, an election in 2023. But on a, on a side note, I think it's really interesting the role that God plays in our elections. A lot of church songs are tweaked for political, because they have a nice, people are familiar with the tune. So it's very easy for them to sing at rallies and campaign ground. But it's really, it's interesting and we can smile about it, but it's also really quite unfortunate, especially I, for the faith that I belong to, Christian faith, how very the, the fundamentals of Christianity is missing from how we execute, not only go about politics as, as, as Nigerians, but also go about governance. The Christian God is a, the scripture says that God is love. It's Sunday anyway, so we can have a bit of scripture in this mix. God is love. And it's very clear, someone was saying the other day, that if you look at the way politicians and those in office behave towards their citizens, that it, it's devoid of love. 
Because if you actually loved someone, you would care that the person has access to good education, access to good health care, that they don't spend three hours on a road that should technically be a 30-minute journey. And so I find it very interesting that God plays a really strong role in our politics, especially in southern Nigeria with Christians, but a very, very minuscule role in governance. Thank you. Okay, uh, Yemi Adam Alekun, thank you very much for your insights. Uh, but and for the great work uh, you've been able to do with Enough is Enough, uh, covering the Anambra election, and joining Arise TV to organize uh, the debate ahead of the election. Well, Modele Sharafa Yusuf, your take on uh, the Anambra election. Uh, one of the uh, major things uh, coming out of uh, Anambra was the uh, conduct of the women of uh, Ebenebe, who refused to collect a 5,000 naira bribe. We saw women you know, in Okanoth, standing up and saying, this is what Nigeria should be like. People should vote according to their conscience and not because uh, of a monetary inducement. However, we didn't see so many women on the uh, ballot uh, paper. 18 uh, political parties, no female uh, gubernatorial candidate. Okay, the women are the ones uh, who vote most. Uh, what can we do, really, to ensure that these people who have faith in democracy are also, you know, included, you know, in this uh, political process we have in Nigeria. I've always been fascinated uh, of the roles of the of women in politics in Nigeria. Um, they usually are the ones to whom uh, politicians make their representation. They are the ones who go. They're, they're mostly the ones who go to the rally grounds. They're there singing and chanting songs and uh, dancing and preparing stuff, but they really don't have a seat at the table. They often don't have a seat at the table. And um, whenever women are considered in politics, there's just this, they're just given tokens. Yeah, they, they, so what Nigerian women need to realize is their power. They need to realize the power that they have the, 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 their share size, the fact that they're the moral uh, conscience of the nation. Uh, the Ebenebe women for, ex women, for example, they have become celebrities, so to speak, uh, political celebrities since, this, uh, the, since last week's election. People have been celebrating them. They've been commending them. And I think that what is going to happen down the line is they will become a reference point for people. Um, I'm sure... Well, it's not unlikely that some of these women collected the 5,000 naira, 3,000 naira bribe that was given in the last elections. And they probably wondered, uh, okay, so how, how, how has that improved my life in the, uh, in the, in in the, past, four uh, in the past four years? And that is the question that we need to be asking all across the country. How has this affected, how much has this made my life better? Well, the candidate came and gave me a cap. He gave me a cap. He gave me um, a T-shirt. He gave me uh, uh, rice and beans packed in one bag. So how, since I finished consuming this bag of rice, what else has this candidate, has this candidate done for me? Has he come back to speak to me? Has he come back to, uh, has, he, has he gotten any feedback from me? How has my life been made better? And for as long as we... Uh, when, when we start asking those questions, the right candidates will be voted into office with or without money. But, you know, for me, the Anambra elections, what's been happening to see uh, the, uh, how the many candidates and their supporters have called to concede and congratulate uh, Professor Solido, the runner-up, Valentine Ozigbe was uh, and his back and his main backer, Professor uh, Go Governor Peter Abi, were some of the early callers. It was a very gracious speech by uh, Valentine Ozigbe, very heartwarming. Ifan Yoba of P YPP also called and congratulated, uh, his, and he says he's not contesting uh, the result in court. Well, he won only one local government and Soludo won 19, so I guess there's nothing to contest. Um, former Governor Chris Ngege was one of the earliest callers, which is very interesting, as he's one of the leaders of APC. 
in, in the state. Uh, as an aside, I, I wonder if Chris Ngigi voted for uh, for his party's candidate. What what, what would it I be? What would I give to be a, a fly on the wall of that polling polling uh, station, <laughs> that polling <laughs> unit where where Chris Ngigi was voting? Where well, the or, rules or, don't or, allow as, that. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's why I said I'd give anything to be a fly on that wall to see. Uh, where he where he thumbprinted, but you know, remember that uh, Chris Uba and uh, his uh, estranged brother uh, were reportedly or allegedly in Gigi's tormentors and, and abductors when he was uh, he, 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 when oh. he was governor. But seriously, as, as former uh, governor Gigi said, I think the president Mohamed Buhari has to be commended for uh, uh, congratulating uh, the winner for. First of all, providing a level playing field for the Anambra elections to hold, and for congratulating uh, the winner in a speedy manner. That confers a moral legitimacy on the winner. Uh, I say moral because uh, the legal legitimacy has not yet, well, even though he has been given his uh, uh, re uh, certificate of return, Andy Uba is said to be uh, ruining his options and uh, calling to question the uh, the conduct the very conduct of that election and how uh, Professor Soludo won. I, I I think that Anambra and Anambra need to be commended for the role uh, for for coming out and voting at all for conducting themselves properly. Um, uh, and I, I also want to say something about uh, Valentine o o Ozigbo. He ran a very decent campaign. He ran a very decent campaign. He, he made a good concession speech. I think he's one person to look out for in okay. Anambra State in the so next few years. So, Modele, I get that. If you had a say in the matter, you would have voted for no, the no, People's no, Democratic no, 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 Party. No, 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 that's not what I said. That's not what I said. Don't, don't. Uh, <laughs> is deductive, <laughs> is deductive. No, 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 I just said, I said, I'm saying to you, I, I just talked about the other candidates. I think Valentine ran a good race. I think he 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 has up. Yeah, he's uh, he's yes, he he's has, the candidate of the PDP. He has um, he has a few more years to learn the ropes. It was his first attempt at politics, and he did well. That's the reason. That's why I'm, I'm okay, bringing him I, out. I get and point. I also uh, say that because uh, Professor Solido, for example, has been trying to be governor since 2009 when he was in PDP before he moved to APCA, and eventually made it uh, 12 years after. So uh, it's the point I'm, I'm, I'm making. Well, the Indian Amra people call it Akuga. Mm. I don't know how they came up with that, but um, I, I, but I, th I really do think that Indian Amra have uh, a wonderful governor in Professor Charles Solido. I, I interviewed him once. I've, I've spoken to him a couple of times, and I am amazed at the uh, at the at this clarity of thought. And his sense of purpose. Well, he's, I a, think he's a professor, first class on us, mm. from the University of Nigeria. No less. And that should be expected. No, no less. Professor mm. Akinten, well, let me come to you. In terms of lessons, what are the lessons that we can possibly take away from Anambra in terms of the performance of the security agencies, the Independent National Electoral Commission itself? And the, despite the fact that the turnout was between 10 to 15%, in the over 5,000 uh, polling units that we had in that election, 2.4 uh, million uh, voters, 18 uh, political candidates, 21 local governments. Uh, what lessons should we go away with? In responding to your question, let me start with uh, the end point of uh, Yemi Adam Alekun on the issue of God on the issue of love, on the rule of songs. The lesson from that is that, look, one song, Christian song is, God is love. He who abides in love <laughs> abides in God and God in him. <laughs> now, Prof, see, don't try to wax a record. <laughs> No, you see, <laughs> you, should stick if, to, you should stick to writing books. If, <laughs> Just stay with scholarship. If uh, Soludo started his campaigns with uh, a spiritual song. But don't, song they all, don't they all? They all do. No, no, hold on. They may do so, but your conviction, your faithfulness determines that. He has an opening song, and he has a concluding, a thanksgiving song, predicated on love. The lesson is that 
if he truly believes in God, who is love, then promote love sincerely. Then God will be with you in the governance of the affairs of Anambra State. The, uh, the indigenous people of Anambra will say Anambra, not the anglicized uh, way. Apuga <coughs> that uh, you are talking about, you, you, you have the local way of doing many things. And they are very <laughs> original as well. So in this case, let him govern Anambra with open heart, love. When um, Modele is talking about... Um, the other candidates quickly coming out to congratulate um, him. It doesn't mean uh, they are sincerely doing that one. This is embittered con uh, congratulatory messages. Please, you see, uh, you can come into the open. This is the beauty of diplomacy too. You, you appreciate when you are embittered. Okay? You cannot tell me that uh, an Andy or uh, Valentine will be happy after having um, expended a lot of money, energy, etc., and then you now come, it is uh, George Obiozo, Professor George Obiozo. That's the more reason why so, we should commend them for coming out to congratulate him coming. and saying and refusing. We to, will see to that one in action. Obiozo says it takes the comfort, the courage of your enemy, of your opponent, all right, <laughs> to come and congratulate you. No, please, uh, let us put uh, sentiments apart. There's some Let, people who are not congratulating him. It doesn't mean they do not appreciate him. That is why my next point of um, intervention is the role of uh, Arise Television. If we are commending any person, either as individual or moral, if Arise Television has not uh, interviewed the candidates the way it was done, to give us, we students, the opportunity to appreciate, to assess. Please, this story of uh, congratulating him wouldn't have been done. Because what Arise did, they asked questions that compelled them to even criticize themselves, to fight themselves beyond the normal political something. To the extent now that uh, Soludo will now have to say, okay, you, do you have certificate? You can know what that means. Now you want uh, Andy now to go back and, and be in peace with him? I do not think so. You now they accuse uh, Soludo, uh, Soludo that, look, he's giving the impression that he's an almighty God. He can do it all. I did this when I was a CBN governor. I did this when I was in the international something. But if, for instance, he did it, either in collaboration with some others, or uh, exclusively he was able to do that. Now this is the time for him to put those competencies. And I think that from the debate, I was personally convinced that if Soludo was not elected, there, in fact, something would be wrong. God will even sanction those people who did not vote for him. That was my belief. Because he was so clear as an academic professor, he was articulate. In terms of analysis, he was very methodological. In terms of facts, he gave the statistics. And now, in this case, uh, Abga, Abga is essentially an Igbo party, which is fantastic. It reflects the interests of the people. Well, the, the chairman of the party was on the morning show, uh, that's uh, Victor Oye, and he said, no, it's wrong to say Abga is an Igbo party because Abga has won elections in other parts of Nigeria, outside Igbo. That's just, well, you know, you see, when a point we define, of correction. When we define... Because I posed uh, the same question to him. Yes. I've just given you his response. Yes, I'm just, uh, I'm appreciating your intervention to let you know that, look, there are many ways you can define God, depending on your perception and what factors you are looking at. If you are looking at it definitionally in terms of interest, your definition will be different from what... The mere fact that uh, Abga had um, voters in uh, other places. You need to tell me who are the voters there. Are they Igbo people? Are they Yoruba people? 
Are they also people? Well, now, Victoria's so, point is that, you know, INEC requires every political party to be national, and that ABGA, or ACUGA, as they call it, you know, it's a national party with representation across the country. The definition that, that is to have reference. offices. Well, the requirement is to have offices. Well, not necessarily in elections. He insists is, 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 uh -huh. so, is not an ethnic party. And in any case, it's only in Anambra that Agra at the moment uh, is in uh, government. But I wanted us to reflect briefly on lessons learned. Maybe, mm, Modele, I'll, I'll come back okay. to you. All right, okay. The lessons learned are that... Um, one, never give up on a personal level, never give up. As I said, that Professor Solido has been trying to be governor in Anambra for the past uh, 12 years. He's finally made it to, he's finally making it to government house. Two, learn to uh, concede when you have not won. Three, uh, the people need to understand that their votes matter. Maybe if more people had come out to vote on the day, the outcome might have been different. Who knows? Who knows? But uh, the thing is, those who were convinced enough to go out despite the threats are the ones who have taken their candidates to government house. So. Every vote is important. More people should, uh, uh, about 15% about of the electorate voted in, the, in that election, which is, I mean, they, it is a legitimate uh, mandate given to Professor Solido. But then again, he will always, uh, at the back of his mind, be wondering, or others will be wondering, or maybe if there had been more people, maybe the outcome would have been different. Who knows? Uh, those are uh, some of the uh, three uh, well, Yemi Adam are you uh, still there with us? I wanted to ask you about lessons learned. Yemi, Yemi, Adam Alekun, if you are with us, what are the lessons, specific lessons, that you think uh, we may learn or that we may have learned from the Anambra gubernatorial election? Can you hear me? Yes. <clears throat> All right, great. I think we don't have a law in Nigeria of the minimum number of people that must participate in an election. So 25% voter turnout, 20, 15, 10, 5. Even if we had had only 2% voter turnout, somebody would have been declared the governor elect of Anambra State. So as we go into, we have two more off cycle elections next year, Ekiti and Oshun. We will probably have several legislative elections and then 2023. So from the various conversations around third force, APC, PDP, and the other parties that we have, I think what citizens need to know and know very clearly is that votes do matter and votes do count. So five people, 10 people, 200 people, a million people, as long as this is the democracy that we're running, as long as we're using this current constitution, the 1999 constitution as amended with the electoral act, these are how people who lead at different spheres will be chosen. So the onus really is on us as citizens to be clear about the type of people that we want to lead us and then go out to enforce that mandate. And I definitely join Professor Kintari was uh, commending our rise for choosing to host a debate despite security challenges. Mm. I believe it's probably Arise's first debate if I'm not mistaken of, of, that, of that caliber. Because part of, at least for the organization that I lead, our belief in debates is what they allow to happen, that Professor Kintarian once said. And that, again, is another lesson, the second lesson I would say. Because it is when you hear candidates able to challenge each other, contradict each other, and present their opinions that are or their plans that are at variance to their competitor, that a citizen who is going out to vote on election day has the opportunity to make an informed decision. We were unfortunately unable to translate it into Igbo, but that's also part of the, of, of, the, of the objective, to provide opportunities for people to hear it in languages that they understand so they are able to make the decisions. Again, voters, a reminder that these elections are up to those who show up to vote on election day, not those who analyze before or after. Okay, yes, good point. Uh, um um, Yemi Adam Alekun, and thank you for commending our ice news. Actually, that was the second 
uh, uh, you know, debate organized by Arise Television. It's September, around September 26. Arise Television, uh, you know, collaborated with Quichiri Unity Forum to organize a debate. And we had five of the uh, candidates on that occasion. And then the second one, uh, which was done in conjunction with your own uh, group, uh, enough is enough. That was the second one, which had the three leading candidates uh, selected by a team of experts and pundits and analysts. But thank you for the commendation. You are a member of the family. Edward. Other lessons. So, Prof. Yes, we were going to talk about lessons. I yes. asked you about lessons. You talked about something else. That was. Let back to That you. was the intro. <laughs> 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 now you see, from the elections, we discovered that INEC had difficulties with his equipment. That means that in subsequent elections, we have all admitted, hypothetically, that the technology is good, but there is, they need to have a mastery of it. I think they should look at that aspect in such a way that there will not be a repetition of um, technical faults and delays. Another point which you raised earlier is the Ebenebe women. I think it's one of the most significant lessons we should learn. We should promote that this day life, this day newspapers, Arise TV and all others, should try to project the value of refusing to be monetized, to be bought, to be negotiated as a commodity. Voters should not be seen as a commodity you negotiate in the markets and you are giving them money. No, it, it shouldn't be. In this case, the lesson of uh, endurance of voters, you have a 80 year old, even 90 year old people in um, Unit 002, which they showed us. Uh, they were asked, in light of this technical something, do you want to go home? They said no, that they will wait. All people, people who cannot afford the luxury because of their old age, etc., to stay, they were staying. I think these are values we should imbibe and uh, preach to all others, especially when we say the future belongs to the youth. Etc. The youth will begin to learn endurance, patience. A teacher was once a student. Because you are, you are young, uh, doesn't mean you should not be patient. What we have learned specifically, what I admire of, um, you talk about Valentine, is that, look, he too was very patient. He explains his disagreement with uh, other candidates. So by the time we have listening ears, politicians should not be speaking at the same time. One should be speaking, the other one should be listening. Let observers then look at that. I think these are aspects that are not uh, stricto sensu uh, in black and white as part of electoral law, but which largely explain the attitudinal disposition of the voters. I think these are quite important. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Uh, let's move on. Let's take another subject of interest. The National Assembly of Nigeria has passed the Harmonized Electoral Act Amendment Bill and approved the electronic transmission of results and direct primaries for political parties. The approval follows the harmonization of differences in the earlier version separately passed by the Senate and the House of Representatives. In the conference committee report, both chambers empowered the independent National Electoral Commission on how to transmit election results, either electronically or manually. Both chambers also approved that all political parties must use the direct primary mode in picking candidates, despite objection by many political parties. Well, Yemi, I mean, I have to come back to you again on this issue. Well, okay, we seem to have lost connection with uh, Yemi, but, you know, we'll come back to her. Okay, Modele, let me start with you. Clause 52, the uh, controversial Clause 52 on electronic uh, transmission of results. 
looks like it's now been resolved. The House of uh, Representatives had agreed. The uh, Senate originally said, oh, the approval of the uh, National Assembly will have to be sought, and some other agencies of government will need to give approval. But we'll move beyond that now, electronic transmission of results. Now, the other issue is about direct primaries, and that's very controversial. The governors are saying, no, that will not work. The uh, minority uh, the, uh, caucus of the APC in the National Assembly is saying, oh, it is in fact the best way to go because it will assure uh, democracy and proper representation. INEC, speaking through uh, Dr. Festus Okoye, who is in charge of information and voter education, has been quoted that in fact in terms of logistics, direct primaries may overstretch INEC because if uh, elections are conducted at uh, ward levels and all of that, INEC may need, in fact, on one day, over 18,000 adult staff to be able to monitor. So these are the issues. We have a choice now between what is expedient and uh, what is uh, possible. And then the fear within direct primaries, the other uh, side of it argues is that, look, big men, money bags can just hijack the process. So you have the lawmakers versus the governors, with some people saying the lawmakers are not necessarily interested in representative democracy, but that they are interested in their own, you know, survivor in office. What do you think? You are a politician also, in, a, in a way, too. Uh, actually, actually, I am. I am. Aren't we all? Uh, we are all. Aren't we all? We are all in politics. <laughs> well, um, because you can't leave the field. No, we are only political animals. No, we are all no, in politics. No, not professional no, politicians. Ruben knows no, what I'm talking about. No, I'm not a professional about. politician. Okay, the two Ruben of you. But I'm in politics. I'm okay. Uh, Ruben knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> well, professional actually, politicians don't have another job. That's the only thing they do. Absolutely. <laughs> Well, actually, uh, Ruben, if you recall, the clauses that were uh, in contention for a long time were 43, 52, 63, and 87. Yes. But it, is, it was 52 uh, that, um, uh, that caught the public imagination uh, uh, a while ago. You know, to be honest with you, I, I think um, it, it's this harmonization and the fact that the bill has finally been passed is, is long in coming. The process started, if you remember, from the 7th Assembly, and we're now in the 9th Assembly. So it's taken a long time. Just to tell you how much work has gone into this, and how difficult this has been, it has been for them to arrive at a consensus, both houses. Of, uh, the, the both, both houses. Uh, the issue about direct primaries is, I, 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 the direct primaries, I believe, well, I hope, that the president will give his assent to that bill, despite uh, pressures from state governors, as you said, who have the most to lose if internal democracy is entrenched in the parties. If you notice, even PDP bigwigs are, are singing a different tune from that of the initial party, of, the, of that, from that made by the uh, party at the initial stage. Um, I also think the National Assembly members, as you said, will make, uh, probably will make good their threats to override the president if he does withhold his assent. Uh, because for many of them, as you rightly pointed out, their political lives, their very political lives depend on this. Um, uh, direct primaries shouldn't, I, I don't think INEC should worry so much about what is going to cost them to conduct direct primaries, if it is going to deepen our democracy, if it's going to entrench uh, um, transparency, you, in your, in your intro, you encapsulated the problem with indirect primaries. Money bags tend to hijack the process. Uh, people who are in power tend to take over the process and uh, take advantage of it for themselves. So if that is the case, and we're saying that um, let the best candidates emerge, if it's going to cost INEC a little more money to do this, I think so be it. Uh, as for electronic transmission of results, uh, it's about time. I'm glad that um, INEC, the independent, is being put back in, in the Independent National Electoral uh, Commission because then uh, they are the ones who decide whether um, they would conduct uh, electronic transmission of results and not NCC, as was uh, earlier uh, being suggested. The foundation of, of any democracy, Ruben, is free, fair, and credible elections. And it's, 
believe that candidates who emerge through credible polls are more likely uh, to work in the interests of, of, of their party. Collision of results has been a, 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 an exploited weakness in, in the electoral process from the wards to the federal level. And if this is going to make things easier for everybody, so be it. We can get rid of the chaos, the vulnerability to manipulation that can occur between polling booths and, and, and collation centers by way of ballot snatching, violence, intimidation of electoral officers, and so on and so forth. Um, I am looking forward to the president giving his assent to this bill. Well, Yemi, um, let me come to you. Do you think the president will or should uh, give his assent to the electoral um, <clears throat> act as amended, uh, particularly with regard to the transmission of results and also direct primaries, issues uh, on which uh, the political class is divided. Even the APC caucus is divided over the subject of uh, direct primaries. Your thoughts? Thank you. On the electron, electoral trans, uh, electronic transmission, sorry, I think definitely that goes without saying. And the fact that the Senate did the vote face on it is significant in terms of voice of citizens, even voice of governors that added their voice to the issue. And it's also clear that technology is not a silver bullet. As we've seen with the Anambra elections, there were issues with uh, the BVAS system that didn't work in some places. So it's not to say that it will solve all the problems, but at least it allows a parallel tabulation of some sort with the manual collation of, of results. Now, for direct primaries, what I find fascinating is going to be how it's actually implemented. Will Mr. President sign it? I don't know. Mr. President has, has done some interesting things. So it'll be interesting to see, in a sense, who is able to lobby him or make a case that aligns with whatever he believes should happen. And then, therefore, the decision he takes. But I think it's important. It's significant, as Ms. Modili was saying, in terms of our elections, free, fair, transparent because there's no political party in Nigeria that has a database of its members. Aisha Osori wrote in her book, Love Does Not Win Elections, that in PDP's ledger, when she was trying to join the party, places were deliberately kept blank so that your name could be added. So we'll say you were a member of the party from five years ago when you just joined the party in 2021. Direct primaries means there has to be an online database that allows everybody to know who is who, when you join the party and how many members there are. Two significant experiences that show how you can have direct primaries, but they can still be manipulated is for, actually for APC, interestingly, Lagos State elections, Ambodi versus Sowolu, the numbers, I forget the numbers off the top of my head, but the total number of people that participated in that primary, if I'm not mistaken, was more than the total votes of everybody in Lagos that then voted during the elections. <laughs> and the same thing happened in recent Anambra elections. I think, if I'm not mistaken, 340,000 people, APC members, voted for Andy Uba as their party candidate. We did not have up to 340,000 votes for the total number of parties that participated in the Anambra elections. So again, just as technology with electronic transmission is not a silver bullet with the challenges that we've seen, direct primaries are not either because they can be manipulated and we've seen them be manipulated. But I think because it's now backed by law, members of the party now have sort of, hopefully, more voice in ensuring that it is a transparent process. We've seen APC do a recent revalidation, trying to put everything online. PDP is driving this electronic registering for their party. ADC is doing the same thing. So hopefully it would allow, uh, it would allow that to fully be implemented and members of the political party to have a stronger voice rather than money bags controlling who the party's candidates are. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Yemi. I understand we've run out of time. I would have loved us to uh, comment briefly on COP26, uh, which just ended in Glasgow, uh, in Scotland, on the issue of climate change and carbon emissions uh, and what we can do to be able to achieve uh, the uh, target of 1.5 degrees Celsius, or the cap of 2 degrees Celsius that was set uh, in Paris. But, well, you've been watching This Day Live, the Sunday talk show, here on Arise News. I'm Ruben Abati. From my entire team here in Lagos, it's bye for now, and thank you very much for watching.